Hi, everybody, and welcome to today's episode of This Organized Life. I am your host, Lori Palau, and I am super excited to have you joining us today. Uh, with me is Kara Harvey, and Kara is the host of the Purpose Driven Mom podcast. And of course, I love it. We're going to get into it because... I think it's a play on Purpose Driven Life. Not sure, mm -hmm. but we're going to get into that. Um, she's also a mom of three kids. She's a wife. She's actually sort of my neighbor, I found mm -hmm. out. We live a few towns away from each other. And she I'm invited her on the show. She's got a really interesting story. She was a teacher for, I think, eight years and then mm -hmm. kind of had like this change of life situation where she is now in started her own kind of coaching and empowerment community for moms and other women. And so in, instead of teaching kids, I guess she's teaching adults, but she's, again, she's a, a wealth of knowledge and she shares all of her content through the podcast. She also has a blog, uh, her website's Purpose Driven Mom. And we're going to talk all things mom life and really how we can you know, navigate this crazy time. I think we're all still struggling in different seasons from loss and overwhelm and just kind of trying to see an end through sight. So I love talking to other women to get their perspectives and strategies and tips that they can share. So um, without further ado, I'd like to bring out my new friend, Kara, to the show. Kara, welcome to This Organized Life. Hi, thank you so much for having me. I'm super excited to be connected. It feels like even more fun that we're close together, like proximity wise too, because I, I feel like this online space can feel so like lonely and isolating. So when I found out you were nearby, I was like, that's so fun. Yeah, yeah. And it's funny because Kara also just to, for six degrees of separation. So mm -hmm. I think most of our listeners, um, but if you're new to me, I have this partner program where I can have um, a community of other professional organizers who I coach and mentor um, and who I endorse to other people that are looking for on-site help. And one of the organizers in my community um, is actually does some, some freelance work with Kara. So we just have all of these kind of touch point connections. So it was serendipitous for us to kind of come together. So why don't you, I gave our listeners a real top line overview, but can you just take us back, give us a little bit of insight to who you are, what you do, and we'll just go from there. Sure. Yeah. So uh, I'm a mom of three. My kids are three, five, and 14. I kind of call myself this like accidental entrepreneur because it wasn't at all anything I set out to do uh, like most of us. Uh, since I was seven, I wanted to be a teacher. And I remember playing school as a little girl. Like it was, it was in my plan and I was pretty good at it. I loved it. Um, I had a lot of leadership positions uh, and it became my life. It became every all encompassing part of my life. And I had kind of, you know, lost myself a little bit along that way. I um, was feeling really anxious and I wasn't putting any time aside for myself or my family. And it was right around year going into year eight. I remember the moment because I was on track for administration and I was the principal of our summer school program and summer school overlapped with regular school for the teachers. And I just sat in my car and I cried and I went home to my husband and I said, I can't do this anymore. I'm exhausted. I'm burnt out. I was at a high performance charter school where the kids went to school eight to five and every other Saturdays. So I was there 6am to 7pm. I never saw my stepson at this point. He was in like kindergarten my husband's in education too. Like we never saw each other. And I knew that we wanted to, we were getting married. We wanted to start, our, you know, and grow our family. And I was like, I can't do this long-term. And he's super numbers guy, super practical. So we said, okay, well, we need to pay our bills. Um, this is what you'd need to make. Like, what are you going to do? And at that point I was dabbling in network marketing and I was making enough to like cover my product, like that type of a thing. But I, that was all I had. And I thought, well, why don't I give this a try? I enjoy it. It's fun for me. Maybe I can um, make this something where I can make that bare minimum amount we needed. And so I hate the word hustle. Absolutely hate it. But that is what I did. I knew that if I was able to put kind of the work in, I would be able to leave teaching at the end of that year. And so the end of that eighth year, I was able to make that bare minimum amount that I needed to just kind of cover our bills. And I left to become full-time in network marketing. And at first I felt like I was living the dream. I was like, I get to make my own schedule and I'm in charge of all of these things. But I found myself quickly going back into all of the things that were burning me out 
in education. I was back working 40 to 50 hours a week. I felt like I had zero boundaries. I had to answer every message. And if I didn't answer someone right away, like I was going to lose a sale and I was panicking and I was actually really successful. If I, now looking back, I wasn't whatever rank I was supposed to be, but I had grown a six figure business. I had 250 people on my team, but I felt like I was failing because of whatever standards the company had made I hadn't hit. And one day it just hit me that like, this is not it. <laughs> this is not the life I wanted to have. And it was when I was pregnant with my daughter, who's now five, I started dabbling in helping other th things, like helping moms figure out things besides just health and fitness, which was the network marketing company. I started to help them with their schedules and their budgets. And I'm a naturally organized person. So I thought, okay, let's see what this is. But I was still like holding on to network marketing because I was so fearful that I would be judged or shamed for leaving. I just made this huge jump. I still have all my student loans. Like, what are you doing? And it what, took me about two years of trying to work all of it at the same time that I realized that I, I couldn't do it well. Like, you know, when we try to do everything, you know, we just do it kind of mediocre and we don't do anything deep diving well. Like I was still scattered and I was all over the place. And so Two years later, I remember the moment I brought my son home and he was two weeks old and I was nursing him over a boppy pillow and I bought the domain for a purpose driven mom and I made this website and I thought, I know that I can help moms who've been in this hustle mode, who put everything out there for others, find a way that they can organize their time to fit them, their goals, their priorities and their families, not what society says, not what we feel like we have to have, like what really matters to them and not lose themselves along the way. And that's kind of how A Purpose Driven Mom was born three years ago. And now it's, you know, like my full-time income, we've got a team, we've got thousands of students who get to hang out with us in our membership and on the podcast. And it really has become this community, which was so important for me that I helped build like a community of moms that don't feel alone, but can surround themselves with other people who want to go after their goals, who want to learn how to manage their time, who don't want to end their day, like throwing their hands in the air. Like what just happened? I mean, like, let's be real. We all have days like that, but I'm really passionate about helping moms figure out a way to manage their time to align with their priorities. Um, so they can end the day feeling aligned and fulfilled most days, at least. Well, I love it. And I think there's so many people that can resonate with what you're saying and say, I was there or I am there. And you know, I, I always like, but as people are taught, as our guests are talking, I'm always like, you know, jot it down if I like have a thought and you know, what was interesting. And I think so many of us find ourselves in this pattern where, you know, you, you switched from teaching into this other mode, which freed you up from certain kind of handcuffs, if you will, that you yep. had, but your behavior didn't really change. And it was really repeating that same pattern of behavior and holding yourself to that standard. And there's also this other new set of challenges, you know, where, whether it was before I had the stability of a paycheck and benefits and this, and yes, you know, I was working 60 hour weeks, but at least I knew at the end of the day, if I put in that time, I was going to have this. Whereas you know, there's a big allure and I talk to people about this all the time and I'm sure you do as well. You know, there's this huge allure with being an entrepreneur, making your own schedule and, you know, so many things, four hour work weeks and this and passive income, which is, that's the buzzword. I don't like passive income. That's my thing. But, um, you know, there's all these, all these, you know, you know, dreams that we, that we put on and then you realize that you have to like work to make that happen to get to that point and if you're not mindful and you don't have a strategy and a plan and a network of people around you yeah. friends family other people that are in they don't have to be in the same industry but that are in like a similar season of you that you can vent to bounce ideas off of talk to you know it could be very isolating and then it leads to a whole different type of burnout um and i think that to me is you know the big takeaway is saying you know how can we how can we change our mindset and our behaviors alike so that we don't fall into that same pattern just in a different area oh my gosh yeah and i wanted to share too because i think you're right um, I love owning my own business, but it is glamorized um, and nobody talks about like the real thing. So during this time period, when I started my business, 
Um, my husband had lost his job at one point for eight months. He was out of work and we only had my brand new business income. So we were sitting there online at the food bank getting food stamps like for eight months. We almost lost our house. And I think for me, it was one of those things that I had this plan you're talking about. I was like, this is where I want to go. And like for me, God partnered with it. And we were like, where are we going to take this? Um, and I'm so thankful that I kind of had won that guidance, but also had that belief in myself to know that, you know, if I plug in to the right people, the right resources and work hard, I'm able to now make it a place where it's, you know, a full-time income. Um, and I think that's really important. No matter what your goal is or your dream, it's looking at all the sides of it. Like, hey, what could happen? Where are we going to go from there? Like when the hiccups kind of happen in your life. And then also dealing with the ups and downs of it all. Like I had to make sure that me and my husband were on the same page about a lot of things. And there were times where the conversation was, Hey, are you going to go back to work? Like I was on maternity leave technically, you know, if I was working at a regular job because I just had my son for those, for the first few months, you know? And so when it turned into the new year and he still didn't have a job and I was dealing with postpartum anxiety and depression, like it was really hard. And he asked, he's like, what, what's the plan? And we had that sit down conversation. Um, I said, all right, well, here's the timeline and here, here's, can we give it to this time? And if it's still not working, like I'll start looking for other things. And that's actually what I started to do. So my husband, um, he actually now he's a CEO of the school, um, but at this point he was a principal. And so he found other jobs. He wound up delivering newspapers at two o'clock in the morning to try to like make it meet, ends meet because he really wanted to support me in what I was doing. But at some point, I realized like this is not sustainable. So when he was hired back and like got like a real principal position again, he was still doing both jobs because if you've ever been out of work for an extended period of time, like you're in all this debt, like you still have to catch back up. It took us two years, honestly, Lori, to even just get caught up. It took us until 2020 to get caught up from all the debt we got in because we had nothing coming in and had to pay bills. And so he was still doing the newspapers and, and I just felt like this tug, like I need to do something here as my business grows. So I got a part-time job at the mall working at the Barnes and Noble. And I would, you know, my kids would go to school nine to 12. I would work. Um, my husband would come home at 545. I would haul my behind over to the mall. I'd work from six to 10 on Saturdays and Sundays. We were passing ships for a while because we knew that we had to get some momentum going. And so I think that it's important too, when you go after your goals and your dreams, the thing is, like, it's not always rainbows and sunshine and nobody wants to talk about it. We just want to talk about, like, what it looks like in my pretty Instagram picture. Or we don't want to, like, be vulnerable in sharing those really hard moments. Um, but I think that becomes, like, a testimony of, like, wow, look how, like, things can be. And also what you can do when you have a focused plan and you, and you stick to it. Does it always work out? No, not at all. But I think it's important to know that, like, while, yes, like, I have a successful business now. It wasn't always that way. And you have to make sacrifices sometimes along the way. But I think what's important about the sacrifices is that they're sacrifices that are still aligned with your priorities, right? I had told my husband I was going to get that second job because I wanted him to not have to get up at two o'clock in the morning. Like that was a priority. It wasn't like, oh, you just keep working that so I can chase my dream. No, like I needed to make a sacrifice on my end to help out where he has always supported me. So I think it's also like, what are those priority driven sacrifices, I guess, are important to say, you know, cause we get into that hustle culture of everybody's gotta be up at 3 a.m. And you know, if you sleep, you're lazy, like all that nonsense that I, you know, <laughs> that people spew. I think it's assessing like, hey, what, where are our priorities for me, my family, my goals, what works for us, what's not working and, and where can we adjust? I love, I just like want to reach through and give you a hug because <laughs> I, what you just said is so like honest and truthful and so important for people to hear because there's several things. I mean, that you like, yes to everything that you said, but I just want to kind of go back and highlight a few things so people can just like marinate on this. First of all, the open line of communication between you and your husband. Life is hard. And especially when you get unexpected blows of job loss and whatever, it could be health, it could be job loss, it could be, a, you know, a death, whatever it is. If you guys stop that communication and you guys do not continue figuring out, okay, how do we navigate through this? You're already like falling behind. So the fact that you guys just said, okay, here's a deal. This is what I want to do. I, let's set a realistic timeline. So like, and we'll reassess. And I think that's healthy for anybody in anything. You know, I just, I have a, a good friend of mine who is looking on, she's kind of 
had her own business for a while and is looking to maybe, she doesn't love the entrepreneur part. She loves like the job, mm-hmm. but not the mm-hmm. entrepreneur part. So she yeah. was offered like a part-time job doing the job part, but working for somebody else. And, you know, she was like, oh, it sounds great. And I was like, she was running by me. And I said, here's my advice. I think it's great. I said, but why don't you say, let's set a, a, a six month trial. Mm-hmm. Let's make this a six month trial period. Because right now, all the parts of your job that you don't like, the accounting, the billing, the you know, whatever the business part of your business, you're, you're like, Oh, this is great. I don't have to do it. But now you have to, now you're going to be accountable to somebody else. So you might not be realizing what you'd be inheriting. So setting a, a, let's do a trial period and see how this works. Now, obviously not everybody can do that in every situation, but she was like, I never thought about it. I said, because then you guys can reassess and reevaluate both of your goals at that point. So the fact that you and your husband did that is great. The fact that you, it, I'm sure that, and I don't want to use the word easy, but a lot of times it's easier for people to say, you know what, I'm just going to abandon this dream or I'm just going to put it on the back burner and I'm just going to go back to the, to the devil, you know, right. I'm going to get a job teaching. I'm going to get, you know, I'm going to get a, a stable job and we wouldn't be in the, you know, in the situation that we're in. And I see a lot of people doing that because it seems easier than fighting, trying to fight through. And it's vulnerable when you're going into unknown chartered waters. So I love the fact that you didn't abandon that. So I think that's great. And then the third part is saying, all right, well, if we're going to do this, we have to, and we have to try to make this work. We got to both buckle down and make these sacrifices and get extra jobs. And that's going to sacrifice our family time, or we're not going to go on vacation, or we're not going to do this. I mean, I just, I just had um, Rachel Cruz on not too long ago, and she was talking all about budgeting and money and habits. And these are all conversations that a lot of times couples don't have. And, you know, your priorities and what you each one of you wants, if you're not communicating that, there's it's hard to it's hard for you to stay focused on reaching your goals as a family, which is why so many people start this entrepreneurship journey in the first place because they want more quality time. So yeah, and then the the resentment, right? That like feeling if you're not communicating, not like we're perfect communicators. We are. My, my husband and I are like exact opposites. Like I'm an Enneagram three, and he's a nine, and it's just now that we know that it's okay. Like we can deal with each other we're big enneagram people here at yes the i saw well i saw so i was like oh you yeah like, yes. now husband. that i know his nineness it's yes. i understand it and he knows my threeness and we can like figure okay this is what's happening here but like that takes learning and growth and i think it's an interesting thing because i was just talking to one of the members in my uh club the other day and we talked about this this skill development thing that we don't think about So like we go after our goals, right? And whether your goal is to start a business or declutter your house or read X amount of books in the year or whatever it is, we forget that there's a learning curve when we go into regular jobs. um, And I work, you know, primarily with moms. So like we, I feel like moms like split things. They like will compartmentalize the skills they learn. When you were at whatever job you've ever had before you became a mom, like you had a handbook and all these things that you have to follow. So now we forget those things when we go after our goals there's a learning curve. So there's a difference between like, I don't know something and like that discomfort of that. Like I don't like tech. So like for me, when I learn tech, I'm like, Oh, this is so frustrating, but I know it's a learning curve versus like I'm pushing against something as an excuse or I'm letting it kind of like get in the way. And I think that you have to be willing to learn things. Like I bought a course last year on how to like clean my house, which is was super embarrassing to even admit, but I never learned how to like, I don't know how to clean an oven. I'm like, I don't know, spray stuff. Like, you know, I have no idea what I'm doing. And I had to humble myself and buy a course. And I wasn't doing it for so long because like one, it was like embarrassing. Shouldn't I just know how to do things? And I was frustrated with the fact that I had to have a learning curve to get my goal. But I think that's something that's so important when we go after whatever your goal is, is remembering that like, you're not an expert in it yet. 
it's okay if it's hard and if you have to struggle, but you also need an intentional plan for learning. And so I teach a weekly planning system. And part of it is 15 minutes a day minimum of learning something for you and learning. This could be, I want to work on my self-confidence or my self-esteem or, you know, time management, but it could be skill development. we have women in my group that are like learning languages or taking courses on like how to play the guitar and fun stuff like that. I think we forget and we just think we're supposed to know stuff. We think we're supposed to just like show up and all of a sudden, like, I'm not achieving my goals because of my willpower or I'm lazy. And like, I cannot stand this phrase of um, what is it like? Your why needs to be stronger than your excuses. Like there's nothing wrong with your why it's your plan. You literally just didn't make a plan. It just had holes in it. And you just need to fill the gaps of the holes um, because willpower is, it's a muscle. It's something you have to grow and you're not lazy because you set out this goal to like declutter your whole house, but you never learn strategies to declutter. So you get caught in the same, you know, mounds and mounds of, piles of paper every time. And I think that we get so down ourselves, especially as women thinking like, if I don't know something right away, then I'm a failure. If I need to get help, then I'm a failure. If it takes a long time, then I'm a failure. And it's like, whatever you're going after, you have to allot in this learning curve of skill development, or you're never actually going to get there. You're just going to kind of like halfway do something, but we don't want to invest that time because we just assume we're supposed to know how to do everything. No, I think it's so true. And there's a couple of things. So I I was listening to a podcast. I wanted, it may have been Jen Hatmaker. I'm not sure, but it was, uh, and they were talking about that whole, like, I should know this and I don't know this. And the phrase that they were using was, I just haven't learned that yet. Mm -hmm. You know? So it's really just about saying, oh, you don't know how to use Google sheets. Well, I just haven't learned that yet, you know, and okay. here's how you can, as opposed to say, I don't know this or I can't do this. The other thing is, well, there's a few things. So one of them is, and I deal with the people having that shame and embarrassment of that. Mm-hmm. I should know how to declutter. Yeah. It's a learned skill. Yes. Yeah, some people like anything, there's natural athletes. There's people that can just naturally just come up and play the piano, but the majority of people need to be taught. And organization is no different. And all of those strategies, they're learned skills and there's different approaches that work for different people and different Enneagram types and all the things. So, you know, just recognizing that there's no shame in not knowing something. And, you know, maybe it's because I'm older now and hopefully a little bit wiser, but, you know, I, now if I don't know something, I'm either A, open to learning it, or if I know that it's just really something that I don't have to know, or it's not in my wheelhouse to hire or outsource or delegate it to somebody who can and is good at that. And that's all right too, you know, and just knowing that, Hey, I'm in a position for whatever that is. And it could be something as cleaning your house to mowing the lawn to hiring an assistant. You know, there are different times where, okay, maybe I can't have a cleaning person right now because we're in a season financially that we can't afford one. But when we get there, that's something I want to outsource. That's fine. List your priorities and what you want to be able to take off your plate. And the other thing I just wanted to say is, you know, I, and I used to do this, right? I was totally um, a victim of this, of feeling like I couldn't give myself permission to read a book or to do something. And it was like, oh, I can't do that. I can't take time to learn a language or do a skill or whatever. And I did this a lot when my kids were small. And yes, my time was a lot more tied up in their needs and carting them from activity to activity. So yes, that was a real thing, but it was also a mindset where I didn't allow myself and set those boundaries. And really I just became a martyr about it. And then I would look at other people. I'd look at other moms that are going to the gym and in my head, I would secretly judge them. But in essence, it wasn't about them. It was about my own insecurities. And why do I not feel confident enough to say, it's okay for me to like put my kid in the daycare or hire a babysitter or get somebody to watch them so I can go work out for an hour. Like, it's insane. Like I look back at myself, I'm like, oh, what was I gonna like get a badge? Like here's a gold star. Cause you know. But don't we think it, don't yes. we think that we're supposed, like we wear busy, like it is a badge of honor. 
But, you know, just because you're busy and you have more things written in your planner does not mean you're productive or doing anything. And so I actually teach this concept of it's called the 15 minute formula, but it's essentially these 15 minutes. And I started it for a few reasons. One is because like practically, right, I can convince myself to do anything for 15 minutes, but I could also scroll TikTok for 15 minutes, right? Like it's so easy to pass but it's so easy to do. And I found that moms were underestimating. We do one of two things, right? We underestimate or we overestimate how long something's going to take. So it takes me, and I've timed it, uh, six minutes to unload my dishwasher, but I'll complain about it for 25 before I have to go do it, right? And so I realized that if I could help moms see like, hey, if you're reading 15 minutes of a book a day, if you're taking, watching one lesson in a course, like that's amazing and you're going to make traction. Because I also found that a lot of people think 15 minutes isn't enough because we're taught that you got to go big or go home or go in and do all the things. But as a mom of three, like I, I would love a two hour block to do anything, but I don't have it. So am I either going to stay in this victim mindset of like, well, you know, I can't do it perfectly for two hours. I'm not going to do it at all. Or am I going to make action? The second piece that helps, I think, with looking at things in these like tiny 15 minute chunks is the confidence. Because I feel like with the women I work with, their confidence is shot because they've tried their goals. Um, you know, how many resolutions have they written on their list year after year and they haven't achieved them. And so they honestly, at this point, like don't believe they can do it in some deep place in their mind, right? Like this ingrained limiting belief, this belief system from however you grew up, like, you know, all that is told them like, I'm not worth spending the time to do, or it's selfish if I do this, or it's not going to make a difference if I only do. And we try to get rid of words like only and just and should in my community, because those are all limiting you. We always say like, stop shooting on yourself. Like I should have done that. I should have done that. <laughs> ah, like, right. Because it's like, yeah. says who? And so I think that the piece that I love is that 15 minutes will grow your confidence to Remind yourself that one, you're worthy of at least 15 minutes a day, but two, you can, or you're capable of doing that. But also three, it's not about, um, cause some people will say like, but I thought we we're supposed to dream big. And I'm like, this isn't about truncating your goals. It's about creating a realistic plan. So if I have this goal of this like grand evening routine I want to do, or like, I want to finish this book by the end of the month. And I've mapped it out to read one chapter a day, five days a week. And I do that, that's amazing. And I can pat myself on the back, but what is always gonna happen is that there's just gonna be some days where you're gonna get your momentum going and you're gonna read two. And then there's some days you'll read three and you're like, whoa, look at you showing up. And it's about not just doing the bare minimum, but customizing it for the days where my kids play more independently and I get more reading time or you know, the days I have extra time blocked out to read but not setting myself up for failure. Like if I don't sit and read for you know an hour a day, I'm, I'm not serious about my goal or I'm going to fail at my goal. It's really that mindset switch. And then I find most women will go above and beyond what they say because that flywheel starts moving, right? If you're the compound effect, it's like goes just going to keep going. Your momentum is going to get you through. Um, but it's not just the momentum. It's this mix of a plan that's like set you up for success and the momentum that is where I see most women like finally getting um, that traction to believing they're worth the 15 minutes, believing that that 15 minutes is going to make a difference um, and getting rid of that guilt and that shame that we have. Because let me tell you, like people are going to judge you, right? Like not everybody's going to like you. Your mother-in-law is going to have a thought about something. That person who sees your thing on Instagram is going to think you're selfish because you went to get a manicure or something like that. Um, I hear it all my kids, my preschoolers, they're at school. And I hear it from people all the time that it's selfish of me that I send them to school right now. Okay. That's not your life though. You can't worry about that. You have to look at you, your priorities, your little like, you know, home and everything in it. And then when you're strong in your priorities, you can make the plan that's aligned. Not, not that other plan that you think you're supposed to have. I mean, but that's the work, right? That's not like an overnight thing. And some days I don't even believe some of that myself because it's hard to believe every day. But most days um, I feel like I've been able to live this aligned priority driven life because I had to stop caring about if somebody on Instagram was going to send me a nasty DM because my sink is full of dishes, but I'm sitting here working. Yeah, no, I think it's great. And you've covered so much. We're going to take a quick break for everybody. Let them ever just have a, a quick minute. And then we're going to come back. We're going to talk about a few more strategies and um, just con continue the conversation. So everybody sit tight.
So you've obviously given us some, you know, your, your kind of one go-to thing. Well, I don't know if that's your one go-to, your 15 minute. And I love the 15 minute rule. We talked about the, the 15 minute rule. I think accountability and actually putting it into practice yes. um, is, is still challenging for some people. And when do I do it and how do I do it? What are some other kind of guardrails? So if you're dealing with people and, and I don't know, maybe you could speak to kind of the types of women that are in your community. Are they women of all ages? Are they moms? Tell us a little bit more about kind of the people that you're, that you're, your target audience. And then where, where you're finding some commonalities of things that they're struggling with, maybe especially relating to like our COVID life um, and how they are really putting these into practice with accountability partners or the discipline. Because again, I, you know, everyone's gonna leave this conversation feeling pumped and motivated, mm -hmm. and then we're gonna get back into our routine. Yep. <laughs> Yep. Uh, so, about that. Yeah. Let me tell you, you know, it's really interesting. I think about this a lot because people will say like, well, what kind of moms like do you connect the most with you? And I've actually found, obviously we have outliers, but the majority of my moms fall into one of two camps. One is like moms of younger kids because they're realizing that they're starting to like lose themselves along the way and they want to nip it right and be like, let's get it together. The other are moms of high school to empty nest to grandmas because maybe they've lost themselves along the way and they want to get it back. And I was like trying to piece it together. I'm like, who is it? And it's, it's either the people who were at the end of the journey that young mom's trying to prevent or those um, moms to younger kids who are like, help me get it together. So it's super interesting. And it's a mix too of like stay at home and work from home, work out of the home moms. Because, you know, everyone's like niche down. I'm like, I, I can't. Like, it's really just the woman who's out there who's like, I'm tired of being a victim of my time and I want to take time for my goals. Um, but I notice a lot of commonalities between all of those things because I teach time management, productivity and goal setting. Right. And the biggest thing that I hear over and over continuously is that they get thrown off with distractions. Like I can make a great plan. Like we said, like you can make a great plan, but I can't follow through with it because life throws me all these curveballs. And we've seen that right with the pandemic. Like, honestly, like you have to just plan to have your plan like uprooted at this point, because in the beginning it was so unsure, you know, and uncertain. And now it's like, uh. so I always say, like I said, my kids are at school, but I have in my mind a, and, and on paper, a plan for like what happened. So a few weeks ago, one of the teachers tested positive for COVID. They were all home for two weeks. And instead of panicking, I already had made a plan for this, like a contingency plan. And again, this goes back to all the things we do in traditional jobs where there's plans for all the things, but we don't make plans for life to happen. Like, Lori, it's so funny to me because moms will be like, you know, it always takes us so long. I can't find the shoes in the morning. Or then all of a sudden this kid needs this and this person needs this for me. And this phone call that took 20 minutes takes 30. These are all actually predictable things that pop up but aren't planned. And we forget to plan for those types of distractions and we let them throw us off. You've ever had like a plan for something in the morning and then it doesn't go well. You're like, ah, oh, the day is scrapped. I'm done with it for the rest of the day, right? And so one of the things I notice is mom struggling with this distraction piece because we do this thing, I call it like the stop and drop, you know, when someone like my kid needs deodorant and they're like, you know, it's my stepson. So we are like, Kara, I need, I need some deodorant. I'm out right now. He's 14. So he stinks. So obviously Nick needs deodorant. I'm like, well, you know, like I used to say like, great. Okay. I'll go to the store as soon as I can. And I would stop my plans or, um, you know, I see an email pop up and I would jump on it right then and there. And then I'd be going down the email rabbit hole and suddenly I'm on Facebook and I don't know what happened. Right. And we do this as moms because it goes back to that, um, that motherhood mindset that this women thing where we feel like we have to do everything for everyone all the time. I just was being interviewed yesterday for a podcast and I had this exact conversation where one of the greatest gifts I ever taught my kids was that the world doesn't revolve around them and I'm not dropping what I'm doing now obviously we're not talking about like something monumental your kids right. you know in danger but like oh I forgot my uniform well now you're gonna remember next time to yes. pack it you know yeah or, I forgot my lunch at school <sighs> drop it off no sorry yes. figure it out it's, it's so challenging because I think that it depends on your personality and stuff as well. Like I'm a reformed, semi-reformed people pleaser, I guess. And for me, and I know many women, we equate our worth with what we can do for people. It makes us feel good to help other people. And, and there's nothing wrong with that. So, so I'm a three wing too. I'll throw that one in there. So I love that. Like, I just like love to help. It's just like in me, but I realized that 
I was becoming the martyr again. I realized that I wasn't having any boundaries. And, you know, Kara on Sunday who sits and makes her weekly plan, like she had a plan for that week and I was not respecting myself either. And so um, a tip listeners can take if you're like, oh, that's me. Like my, if my husband was like, hey, we're out of this. I go to the store right away. If a work call, somebody needs it, I jump and do it right away is being proactive about things you don't know are going to happen. And I started to do this thing in my planner called thought catcher time. Right. So essentially what I do is I map out like 30 minutes twice a week. I do one on Wednesday mornings and I do one on like Saturday afternoons where I don't map anything. It's complete white space. I don't plan anything in there but I plan going into my week that I know that I'm going to be in the shower and remember like, Oh, I was supposed to call the doctor or some, you know, I need the deodorant, like all those things. I know it's going to happen. I just don't know what it is. And so what I do in my actual planner is on the side, I have a thought catcher list and you can do, I just digitally sometimes with Trello too. Um, and then I go through and I write down all those random things that pop up that I forget. I don't stop and drop. I write them down because I know that on Wednesday mornings, I drop my kids at school and I go to Target for a half hour. That's my errand block. And I'm not going to stop because I've planned for it. On Saturdays, that's when I make phone calls or do all the random things around the house that I forgot. Because again, when you take the time to make a plan for yourself, you've got to a lot for time for life to happen, to make this life-proof plan. And if you're actually saying, Okay, I know Wednesdays and Saturdays are my two 30 minute thought catcher times. You can start to create those boundaries with your family. So I would say to my son who, you know, who needs the other like, okay, cool. Like you can use mine right now. But here's the thing. Next time you get low, what you're going to need to do is like tell, I'm not going to say it because she'll, you know, tell the little thing that to add it to the grocery list. Mm -hmm. That's what she, I was like, if I say it, she'll start talking, but you know, tell her to add it to the grocery list and I'll get it on Wednesday. And I think this does a few things. One is it lets you stick to your plan. Two, it teaches boundaries. It helps everyone like think in advance. And it also shows like, okay, I'm not ignoring you because I think we feel a lot of guilt if we don't jump and act on something. Hey, I'm not ignoring this thing, this work project, this email, this errand, this phone call. I'm going to put it in another time. And then we can actually not feel guilty about staying focused on what we have to do. And that's why I love to like time block too. Cause I, I make like thematic time blocks. Huge time blocker. Yeah. Huge like I don't feel blocker. good. Like I'm not joking. There's a, a sink full of dishes. I don't feel guilty about it because I know that I have it mapped out at four o'clock, I'm going to load the dishwasher. Cool. Like, so I don't worry about it. And I think that creating these pockets for thought catcher time, it's like you being proactive, knowing that life is reactive, right? It's like, okay, I've got these pockets. I know that's where I'm going to do it. And that's a really great place to start is pre-planning for, I don't know, disasters, you know? And then if you're even unsure about like how long something's going to take, I also always recommend doing like time inventories, maybe once a quarter. I don't like to do them all the time because they can obviously be time consuming because you're writing everything down. But this goes back to the under overestimating of our time. Totally. Um, because if you know, every time I call my grandma, like I have it written down. Okay, cool. I'm going to make a quick call to my grandma on the way to Target. But I know my grandma's going to talk for 25 minutes. So it's like, if I know these things, I can plan better for them. And then I can really see like where I'm managing my time and where I'm prioritizing it. I love it. I love everything you're saying. And I mean, it's, it's all stuff that, you know, we teach here too. And I think it's, it's great. I always say plan for the unexpected and, mm -hmm. you know, and building in margin into your schedule yeah. because something unexpected is going to go on, go wrong. You know what? Your computer is going to, you know, crash or you're going to not be able to, you know, zoom's not going to work and you're going to, something's going to set you back 10 minutes here, 10 minutes there. Like you said, this kid's school's going to call something's bound to happen. Yeah. And the other thing, which I just want to, again, kind of reiterate and piggyback on is, you know, years ago, like I'm dating myself, like years ago, I wrote this article called being the CEO of your home. And it was like, kind of cliche and catchy, but it was really about how women in, in particular were, were frustrated because they were like, I could be, you know, the CEO of a company or of a department or whatever, and I get stuff done and I can do all these things, but why in my, ha why in my house can I not manage mm -hmm. to get anything done and nobody listens to me and, you know, I'm just a hot mess. And it was, it really comes down to understanding in, in corporate or in any type of business, it could be a school, it doesn't even have to be corporate. There's different people that do different jobs. Not one person does everything. You know, the person who's cleaning the toilets is not the same person that is, 
you know, working in the office that's out there in the trenches on the front line. Like everybody's got a different role, but yet somehow in our house, we feel that we have to do everything. And the other thing is there's, there's consequences that you can see. There's measurable consequences. So if you don't turn in a report or deliverable to a client or to a teacher or to a coworker or whatever your, you know, workplace setting is, there's a consequence for that. And what's funny is, in our homes, there's a consequence too, but it's not actionable by you're getting fired or you're getting on a performance plan, but you're seeing these consequences in other ways. You're stressed, you're yelling at your kids, you're overwhelmed. So, you know, there's this level of accountability where you're like, okay, if I, I know that I need to do these things, how can I put in, and I might be the type of person that struggles with discipline. There's so many people that really say, I want this, but I just struggle with the discipline to execute it. And that could be any grammar related. It could be, there's so many different ways, but it's, if you know that you are somebody that needs that extra layer, then you need to be proactive and get it. And I talk about this on my show, my kids, everyone knows this. You know, I have one daughter in particular who really struggles or she, now she doesn't really struggle as much because she's, we've put in these parameters over time, these checklists, these accountability partners, and she has them at school and she has them here to kind of get her to a point where she can now go off to college and fly independently, but it didn't happen overnight. And what, what strategies we needed for her looked very different than it did for my older daughter. And that's okay. And I think that's where as women, as moms, we have to look at having that honest conversation about the person in the mirror of say, okay, going back to that whole, I should be able to do this when maybe that's just not your natural, you know, God-given talent, you know, maybe you need to have a, an accountability coach or partner. So, yeah, I didn't get to touch on accountability, but I wanted to, to add to that because I think that sometimes we think it's wrong if we need like external motivators, like I said about the willpower, right? Like we should just be able to do things. And if I don't do it, there's something wrong with my willpower. And I always say like, sometimes you need external motivators while that internal motivation muscle grows, especially if like your confidence is, you know, locked in. Um, I taught special education. So I taught um, students behavioral disabilities like my entire eight years. And so I know what works with like a senior in high school probably will work with me too. And they like stickers and tickets and prizes as well. And there's nothing wrong with that. I think it's about having an intentional plan, right? You want to make sure you're scaffolding back your rewards like it's not like when you're potty training right like my kid gets you know an m&m every time he goes to the bathroom and then we wean that back i think there's nothing wrong with those things and so i always recommend to the women in my group before you make a goal for the month give yourself an incentive what are you working towards and so we actually just went through um, a course to, together um because we had a lot of new women join up in january and so we all went through it and i said i want you to pick what you're going to give your gift yourself at the end and some of them picked like a new pair of running shoes or a book or just time by yourself and i always tell them you can do a couple things. You could like, you know, put it in your Amazon cart and just like look at it. You could buy it now and have it, or you can even 30 days, put like a dollar a day aside, like do the math. And really like I did that when I did whole 30 every day I did it. I was like, all right, $1, $1. And then I went and bought myself something with that. Because I think that if you have that, again, it's not always about the why, like my why for like wanting to be healthier is very strong. I know that, but I need the plan. Like I need the support system. It's not just about being able to just naturally do things. And so come up with your um, incentive, your reward, if you will, and then track it. And I think that's a place where people need to make sure you're doing this or you're going to lose um, motivation and you're going to lose steam, right? What we track, we can um, excel in. What we track, we can improve on. And so I always think it's important, like you're tracking all of your goals, whether you do it in a planner. I'd mentioned that I use Trello for stuff, whether it's a sticker chart, because then at the end of the week, one of the things that I hear a lot is uh, women will say, well, I didn't do this, 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 right? If you ever ask anybody like, well, how was your week? Well, I didn't do this, this, or this. Instead, we start with like, have you ever heard like the to-da list? Like, what did you do? Like, ta-da, like way to go. And I say, when you're tracking, you can take the emotion out of it. And you can actually say like, you know what? I said I was going to work out five days this week, but I did three. Let's celebrate those three and make a plan to move on instead of beating yourself up for the two you didn't do. But if when you don't track it, 
immediately our brains are going to go to, I didn't do this, this, or that. And that's a switch we've got to proactively make to keep motivated. And I think that goes really well in with the like whole working in, in smaller increments. Because again, mm -hmm. I think a lot of times people will just set the bar really, really high. And like, I'm going to declutter my whole house, or I'm going to just, you know, all of a sudden I'm going to lose, you know, 30 pounds where let's just try to start small, you yeah. know, just say, I'm going to declutter a drawer, or I want to try to lose, you know, two pounds this month or whatever. So because if you can set these small actionable wins and you can see the progress, and then that helps with that motivation, as opposed to that end being so far in sight, that one slip up just sets you completely off course. Yeah. Or, or you become like a gold chaser. If you read Atomic Habits um, in it, uh, it's so good. And he talks about James Clear. He, he talks about this goal chasing concept, right? So, you know, when say you're training for like a half marathon and you get there and then you get your soft pretzel and you get your t-shirt, you get your medal. And then what? You move to the next one. And it's, it, you're not enjoying the process. And all you become is this person who's like, and, and for me, again, and year three, like I'm wired for achievement, but I have to stop and enjoy that journey because when you don't enjoy the journey, when you don't look back, when you don't reflect constantly, like I think you need to be reflecting daily, weekly, monthly, quarterly on all your goals. Like I'm huge on it because that allows you to not only see areas of improvement, but allows you to see success. It allows you to celebrate yourself. It allows, it reminds you that's where I was. This is where I am. Like I just said the same thing to my husband the other day. We were like celebrating, you know, where the business ended the year. And I was like, I can't believe this. Like, I feel like, I see, I feel teary. I think about it. Like, I just remember like sitting at that food bank the first time somebody handed me a box of food. All right. I just, and then I look at this and I'm like, this is incredible. But if we don't stop and celebrate it, man, do we always feel like a failure, don't we? Do we always feel like we're not achieving enough or doing enough, you know? And I think that that's so important to build in the celebrations um, and then find your people to, to help encourage you along the way because unfortunately they might not always be your family or your friends um you know when we start to change improve work on goals a couple things happen um some people will embrace it and they'll be our biggest cheerleaders but a lot of people feel really threatened by that a lot of especially like you think about relationships because one they'll think oh my gosh is this person going to need me and i and i remember this this happened um, with me when I was in my twenties, um, I actually had like a, a heavy drinking problem from the time I was like 16 to 26. And when I stopped drinking, um, I remember friends saying, well, if we don't go to the bar anymore, I bet we're never going to like hang out or I'm never going to see you or you won't need us as friends. And they were really threatened by the fact that I had stopped. Um, and that's one piece of it. And then the other piece is that's a mirror that you put up to somebody like you're working on your goals, you're improving, you're doing all these things. Maybe I should be doing these things, but I don't want to be judged on that. So I'm going to, you know, kind of like hit against the system that you're doing. And I think it's important to just be aware that your levels of support are going to vary. Like I would like word vomit on my husband the second he walked in the house about every goal that I was working on until I realized he was a nun. He doesn't. I was going to say, but, oh my God, you probably no, overloaded him. Overloaded. I do it all the time. I work on it because now I know, yeah. but he doesn't need to know every detail. But if we have a date night and he asks about my goals, okay, cool. I can do that. So I think you need to know like who your people are that you can go on Voxer and, and cheer your goals on or talk to in a Facebook group or whatever and realize and accept. And this has been a harder one for me that not everyone is going to be at that deep of a level with you. And it's okay. Like not everyone has to always be your biggest cheerleader, like keep your, um, you know, like your antennas up for people who are sabotaging you and all those things. But I think it's looking at, through it at the lens of like, who are my people? Where is my support community? And and how can I ask them for support at what level? Yeah, and sometimes it's and sometimes it's it's easier to get an outside objective opinion that doesn't have preconceived notion or expectations about you. And sometimes it's just a, it it almost seems like a safer space to just mm -hmm. go outside of of your bubble. And again, like you know, other people's opinions of you don't is none of your business. Like people mm -hmm. are going to have opinions and you know, you got to just do what you feel is, is, you know, right for you. I love everything you're saying. I could talk to you forever, but we have to, <laughs> we have to start to wrap this up. So before we're going to take one more quick break, tell our listeners if they want to learn more about you, your offerings, all the things, where can they go? Yeah, sure. So my favorite place is Instagram. Come hang out with me there. I'm over at a purpose driven mom. 
Um, I also have a free Facebook community. You can just search purpose driven mom community and it'll pop up with just some awesome moms who are trying to live with intentionality. Uh, the podcast is called the purpose driven mom show. So you're listening here. You're probably a podcast listener. Um, so go find me there, uh, and come hang out. Uh, and if you want to learn more about this goals concept I talk about, I do have a free workshop. It's at a purpose driven mom.com slash goals. Uh, you can come watch it and then please DM me if you're listening to this. Uh, later on the podcast, I'd love to hear uh, your thoughts on anything I said today. Yeah, absolutely. And I think you also, which we didn't even get a chance to really get into some of the tech nuts and bolts of things, but you're a big Trello person. And I'm not, I don't use personally use Trello, but I'm like very intrigued. You have a freebie from um, from an organization standpoint, because our, yeah. our listeners are a bunch of obviously organization people. Um, where can they go and just give a quick soundbite of what Trello is and how you use it. Yeah, sure. So I have a weekly planning checklist and Trello board. So Trello is absolutely free. Uh, it is a software you can get on your computer or your app. And I think it is the most underrated tool for moms out there. Uh, everyone uses it business and corporate. And I'm like, no, nah, let's put your meal plan on there. So um, you can literally map out anything in your home uh, when it comes to it. And um, I think the link's a little bit long, um, but I know that we'll make sure you okay, get we're it. Gonna have it. We're going to have it in the yeah, show notes. So link it up worry. there. Mm -hmm, but yeah, you'll get um, a printable checklist if you're like this Trello thing from might freak me out, but you're also going to get a Trello board to help you organize your week with some video walkthrough tutorials for you if you're a Trello newbie. Oh, I'm so excited. Mm -hmm. Maybe we'll have to do like a separate video and that we can all just on put Trello. on the YouTube channel mm -hmm. all about all about Trello. I love it. All right. We're going to take one more quick break. We're going to come back and we're going to just wrap up with our wrap up questions. Hang on. All right, Kara. So this has been super fun, informative, and very inspiring, I have to say. I just, I love your story and your enthusiasm and just, you're totally the real deal. So thank you for coming in and chatting with me today. We always ask our guests a couple questions because our show is all about honesty and authenticity. So for 2021, and I think you may have answered this, although unless you have a different answer, we ask what book has inspired you in your in your life and it's you reference this one goal chasing book so i don't know if that's going to be your answer or if there's another book but what book would you recommend to our listeners that has really had an impact in your life Sure. Yeah. I actually realized I mentioned two of the ones I always pick while we were That's talking, okay. but I'm going to start you with the compound effect by Darren Hardy, um, because it really is about those, the power and the impact of the small principles and this doing the tiny things every day. That was the one that literally some, it was the first personal growth book I ever read. And it flipped my brain around. I have to do all the things to doing the tiny things will make the difference. Great. And I will make sure that we link up to that. And then our other two questions, which again, you could be serious, you could be lighthearted. Where in this particular season of your life do you feel the most organized and where do you feel like a bit of a hot mess? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I was thinking about this. So most organized, I would typically say with my weekly planning, I have a really, uh, you'll see it in the freebie, a very um, specific and strategic weekly planning process that I do. And it helps set up my week so that I can deal with the hiccups when they come but I was like, oh man, there's a lot of places I'm a hot mess. Um, so I had shared that, you know, I don't know how to clean anything, but I also cannot cook my poor husband. Um, and so um, I struggle with meal planning. I struggle with cooking, like all those things. I don't even know what we're eating half the time. I can do great with breakfast and lunch, but dinner, I'm like, I don't know, figure it out. Oh, so. I can, well, okay. I can help you with that. And we did a great episode that is still one of our most popular download episodes where we did a whole thing about meal planning and how... You basically, I'm just going to, I might butcher it a little bit, but I'm going to try to give it a quick summary. You basically map out like, okay, how many nights a week am I actually cooking? So like, let's say you cook four nights a week, one night you do pizza, one night you have leftovers, whatever. Like, so you map out like how many nights do I really need to cook? Then you pick your top like 10 meals that you like to cook and you basically plug them in. So you like, look at the meals that you're good at, that you know, your family's going to eat, could be your go-tos, whatever. And then you just plug them in on those days and you can decide like, mm -hmm. Hey, is this something that we want to do weekly? Like, are you a taco Tuesday people? Or are you like, do you like to mix it up? And you really only need like really no more than, you know, a dozen plus meals mm -hmm. in a month. So. I like that. Yeah. My, my struggle is I don't know what to cook. Like I'll, like I can plan anything, but I actually don't have like a recipe bank because people have given me say, well, what do your family eat? We sat down more than tell you once. And I was like, guys, I'm going to try this thing. Like what, what are the, your favorite things I make? And my kids, my husband looked at me and they're like, 
Um, I was like, oh crap, we're in for it. Um, so I will tell you, um, I am, it's a work in progress now. that So I have been tracking the meals that they eat <laughs> so that I can make a Good. list because when I started, I was like, I don't know what I'm doing here. Um, there was a lot of things. I don't feel like I was ever equipped to adult. Like I never learned in my childhood how to take care of anything, honestly. And so as an adult, everything feels new to me. I'm like 37 trying to like figure out how to, you know, not make the pasta stick. But, you know, we, I tell my husband, I'm like, I'm good at so many things. I'm not good at a lot of things. I'm just going to focus on the things I'm really good at. And we're going to, we're going to go there. I love it. I love it. Well, Kara, thank you so much. And thank you guys for tuning in. Make sure that if you're not subscribed to my show, click the subscribe button and then head on over and check out Kara's show, Purpose Driven Mom. Subscribe to her show as well. Um, Again, if you are new to us, we are all over social media at Simply Be Organized, or we have a Facebook group called This Organized Life Podcast. We love to hear from you. Um, show topics, anything that you want to talk about, we are here to help. So until next week, I am Lori Plow. Peace out.